So in being with a large law firm, one of the questions um, we get asked a lot is, what is equine law? What is it that you are doing other than spending your winters in Florida? And what I, the best way to explain it is that equine law is every area of law that we are all familiar with, it just involves horses. So we're all familiar with contract laws, whether that's contract drafting or contract dispute resolution. It involves a horse or an equine activity. You're talking about personal injury. Um, obviously, we know that gravity is everywhere, and personal injury is an inherent risk of engaging in equine activities, so lawsuits are going to ensue involving personal injury. Property damage is a very popular topic in our equine law practices because horses are considered property under the law. So anytime a horse is injured and there is a claim or a lawsuit arising out of the injury to a horse or other property damage, it becomes an equine liability or an equine act or an equine um, industry legal issue. Insurance coverage, um, just like was mentioned a few seconds ago, Suzanne's pr practice does have an, an emphasis on insurance coverage, whether that's disputes or just interpreting insurance policies. And again, that can involve horses. It can be a liability policy or an equine major medical or mortality policy that's at issue. Intellectual property, everybody's familiar with the, the Churchill Downs Twin Spires. Um, just like the Nike swoosh, you have intellectual property issues with regard to equine industry matters. And lien enforcement really touches and concerns on any time a service is provided in the equine industry and those services are not paid for. The issue becomes whether or not a particular state has a lien um, on that horse or allows for a lien on that horse for the services provided. Um, agricultural liens such as um, horse liens for breeding, so a breeder can have a lien on a horse. An adjuster, who's the boarding and uh, caring for facility, can have a lien on the horse for unpaid boarding and training fees. Um, veterinarians can have liens on horses. So, again, it's just all those areas of law. We just have horses that are the subject matter. So, in the area of equine law, one of the areas that Suzanne and I want to focus on for purposes of this presentation is the equine activity liability statute. In Minnesota, they refer to it as the Livestock Activity Liability Act, but for purposes of today's presentation, we'll frequently refer to it as the Equine Act. The, right now, 47 states have an Equine Activity Liability Act on the books, and those states that do not include California, Maryland, and New York, they still follow a primary assumption of the risk. Uh, standard, and we can talk about what that involves, but generally speaking, the, the analysis is very similar to that which we're going to identify in today's presentation, so I don't want anyone to be discouraged that might be either in those states or engaging in equine activities in those states, because what we have to, um, what we have to advise you on today would still apply in those states to, to, some, uh, to some regard. In those 47 states, the legislature generally recognized that there is a financial benefit to equine activities. And as Abby just pointed out, in a $122 billion economic impact um, area, that the states want to encourage equine activities in the states. They want to bring that revenue into their states. There's also, as we all know, emotional and physical uh, benefits, but the states primarily want to encourage the financial rewards that reap from equine activities. So how do they balance encouraging equine activities that are inherently dangerous? How do we encourage um, equine activity providers, sponsors, organizers, facilities to continue to make equine activities available when it's an inherently dangerous activity that can give rise to liability exposure? So what the states have done is they said, well, we're going to delineate the responsibility of the equine activity from the provider onto the participant. And so everyone out there should be saying, okay, well, if it's an assumption of risk statute, then why do Yvonne and Suzanne have jobs in the equine industry? Why do we end up litigating or negotiating and resolving equine disputes in personal injury cases if it's assumption of risk? And that's what our material today is going to introduce is, yes, we have the statute. What does the statute say? 
But where are our liability exposures? And what can we do to better protect ourselves so we can continue to encourage equine activities in our respective states? I failed to mention at the commencement of this presentation that, um, like Suzanne being an avid polo player, I'm a three-day event rider. So we are both engaged in inherently dangerous sports, and we want to continue to see our sports being provided and supported by sponsors and encouraged in the youth coming through the ranks of, of sporting activities. So we want to not only as lawyers protect our industry, but as participants ourselves, we get what you're doing with horses. We want, it, you, we want you to continue to engage in these equine activities and make these equine activities available. Now after today's presentation, you may want to take up golf, but we're hopeful that our resources available to providing liability protection will keep you in the sport. So what is so important is making sure that you understand the state law that applies to either the equine activity that you are hosting or sponsoring or possibly even engaging in so that you understand how the law touches and concerns what you're doing with horses. Each state where these 47 statutes are applied include definitions. And why do you care about the definitions? Because the definitions will tell you when you have a participant engaged in an equine activity and whether or not they were injured as a result of the inherent risk of that activity. Again, you might be saying, well, that's great, why do I care? Because under the statutes, if the person that was injured was not a participant, you have no liability protection. If the activity that they were engaged in that resulted in their injury was not an equine activity as defined by the statute, you have no liability protection. If they were not considered to have been injured, as a result of the inherent risks of engaging in an equine activity, you have no liability protection. So how do you know if you have a participant engaged in an equine activity and they were injured as a result of an inherent risk of that activity? The statute, the applicable state statute, will tell us who is a participant, what are the inherent risks, and was this an equine activity? Now I can tell you, everyone who's watching this live and everyone who's gonna watch it later, we can come up with examples of what is an equine activity that's not in the statute. We can come up with an example of what is an inherent risk of an equine activity that's not in the statute. Suzanne's gonna provide you with some very telling differences between just as an example, Minnesota and Wisconsin, to show that one instance in Minnesota may not provide liability protection, but that same exact fact scenario in the state of Wisconsin or the state of Illinois would have liability protections. I'm just gonna give you one quick example. If you think that leading a horse into a horse trailer is an equine activity, right? You're handling a horse, you're leading the horse into the horse trailer, that would be an equine activity. Under Minnesota statute, loading, unloading, or transporting livestock is an equine activity. But I can tell you in Illinois, you won't find that definition. You'll find boarding equines. You won't find loading or unloading or transporting livestock. So how do I best represent my client who found herself defending a case where a handler was leading a mare into the trailer and when the foal decided to leave, the mare got very upset. She started thrashing about. She kicked the handler in the head and he actually died from his injuries. The lawsuit was filed against my client in Illinois where the liability statute does not provide that loading and unloading equines is an equine activity. So you would say, well, they had no liability protection. However, I will tell you that the boarding contract that I drafted for them many years prior did include as a boarding activity assisting in the loading and unloading and transporting equines. So we were able to convince the court that what this handler was doing was actually a boarding equine service not just the loading or unloading of an equine for transportation. And the court found that because it was defined as a boarding activity and boarding equines under the Illinois Equine Liability Act is an equine activity, my client had liability protection. So how the statute defines the activity makes the difference between whether or not you have liability protections or not. And that one example also showed you how a contract actually created liability protection where there otherwise would not have been any. The other thing the statute provides for us are what are those exceptions? 
to liability protection. So I just told you, if you have a participant engaged in an equine activity that's injured as a result of the inherent risk of equine activity, you have liability protections. But what the state gives, the state can take away. There are exceptions under the statute that say if the person was injured as a result of any of these exceptions, then the liability protection you once had is now taken away. And again, Suzanne and I are going to give you some resources available to how do we cover those areas where either the statute definitions has not provided us with the liability protections we want, or the exceptions have taken it away, what can we do to, in, to increase our liability protection? And then the last thing provided by the statute that's important for you to have a takeaway from for today is the statutes require warning sign postings. And we're going to, uh, Suzanne's actually going to get into what the warning sign posting is in Minnesota, which might be slightly different than Wisconsin or Illinois. So it's important to know in your particular state, wherever you are engaging or providing equine activities, that you comply with the state statute. Minnesota has gone so far as to require the posting. And if you don't post properly, you will lose your liability protections that you otherwise would have had. So if anybody asks, do I need to post a sign? The answer is yes. And Suzanne's gonna provide you with the information that you need to know where you're supposed to put these signs, sort of wallpapering your indoor and outdoor arenas. So with that, I am going to pass it on to Suzanne to actually give you um, much more detailed education on how these statutes differ and further emphasize why it's important to know which state law applies to your equine activity. Thanks, Yvonne. And it, like Yvonne said, there are some really stark contrasts between Minnesota and Wisconsin um, law with respect to the Liability Act definition. So it's really important to take note of those differences, and we'll talk about them right now. Uh, with respect to the definition of equine activity, what is it? In Minnesota, the statute defines it as an activity that involves the maintenance or use of horses, provided the activity is not performed for profit. So that is a big limitation in the Minnesota Equine Liability Act. Wisconsin, it's much broader. It's not related in any way to whether or not you're generating profit. Um, but both states include examples, which are um, what we traditionally think of horses, horse shows, fairs, competitions, performances, parades, um, training, teaching, boarding, shoeing, uh, of course, riding horses and inspecting horses. Minnesota expressly includes a couple of other things, such as grooming, um, like Yvonne said, loading and unloading horses, which is really important, livestock production, which is basically uh, the raising of livestock for food, um, and inspecting horse equipment or livestock equipment. Wisconsin, on the other hand, includes driving or riding in a vehicle that's being pulled by a horse, and that's not included in the Minnesota statute. Wisconsin also includes assisting in the medical treatment of a horse as an equine activity. Um, and then Wisconsin has this sort of catch-all provision that includes as an equine activity assisting a person participating in an equine activity. So say you've got a mom who brings her daughter to a jumping lesson and because she's there, she has to stay for the jump lesson, she sort of acts as the trainer's jump crew assistant. She's in the arena helping put up jumps, change jumps, and you know, this particular jump has hedges and flower boxes, you know, things that a horse sees in its ordinary life, but suddenly throw a pole over it and it's the most terrifying thing ever to the horse. So the horse sees the flower boxes, refuses to jump, bolts left, slams in to the mom who's acting as sort of this jump crew assistant, what happens if you're sued for the mom's injuries? Well, in Wisconsin, you have a good argument that this was an equine activity um, that the mom was engaged in because she was assisting in the jump lesson. Um, you don't have that same argument in Minnesota at all, so it's a, it's a big contrast there. Um, 
Another good example is if you are giving horse-drawn carriage rides in downtown Minneapolis, uh, which happens in the wintertime here. You have a passenger who is about to fall out of the carriage and you see this happening. What do you do? Well, our advice would be gallop as fast as you can the 40 miles to the Wisconsin border. Get across the border before that passenger falls off. Um, because in Wisconsin, not only is riding in a horse-drawn carriage engaging in an equine activity, but guess what? You can also charge for your service and still fall within the act. Um, because of course in Minnesota, an equine activity is something that is not for profit. So big, big differences. Um, and again, to be protected for, um, from liability for the death or injury of a participant in an equine activity, the death or injury needs to result from an inherent risk of that activity. So what are the inherent risks of that activity? Both states define it fairly similarly. Um, it's a danger or condition that is an integral part of equine activities. And the examples that are set forth in the statutes include the propensity of a horse to behave in a way that might result in injury or death to the person riding it or a person around it. And we know that as kicking, biting, bucking, charging. Um, another example is the unpredictability of a horse's reaction to sound, sudden movement, or unfamiliar objects, persons, or animals. I think we all have an experience with a horse who, you know, is suddenly afraid of butterflies. Um, I have a horse, actually in my experience, it's always been the gray horses, uh, who love to spook at, you know, gentle spring breezes. Um, so what happens if someone's riding my gray horse and he spooks because the wind suddenly changes and the rider gets dumped and I get sued? Well, you know, I'd have to argue to the court that he was just reacting to the sound of the wind or the sudden movement of the change in the breeze. Uh, another inherent risk of an equine activity is natural hazards. Um, in the surface or subsurface conditions. So you think of fields that we love to go galloping in, um, but they're filled with gopher holes. And if a horse steps in it, throws the rider, a court's gonna find, likely find that that's an inherent risk of an equine activity. Um, another one is collisions with other animals and other objects. So, you know, for example, if a horse is on a cross country run, misses a jump or runs into it, tosses the rider, rider gets hurt. Okay, so another difference now though is in Wisconsin, again, has much broader language um, with respect to the inherent risk and it includes the potential in Wisconsin for the person participating in the equine activity, for example, the rider, um, to act negligently um, for the rider or participant to fail to control the horse or not act within his or her ability. And that's really big in the Wisconsin statute. So if you have a rider who um, has only ever trotted poles and then suddenly decides on his own accord to jump, a four foot jump falls off and breaks his back, that is going to be a, an inherent risk within the definition of the Wisconsin statute. So who is a participant, as that term's defined in the statute? Um, the Minnesota Act defines it as someone who directly and intentionally engages in an equine activity. Wisconsin, again, is broader, and it simply says a person participating in an equine activity. Um, and that is you know, someone who could include someone who's assisting a participant in any fine activity because we just talked about how Wisconsin recognizes that someone assisting a participant is engaged in an equine activity. Um, so who's not a participant? Spectators. And what's a, who's a spectator? Well, a spectator um, is someone who's not a participant who's in an authorized area for a spectator. So if you regularly uh, hold events in, on a field at your property, but the barn isn't uh, an authorized area for spectators, put up a sign that says no spectators beyond this point. Uh, you'll see on the slide there's a section in that that says this is not a spectator area. All persons in this area will be regarded as participants and limited by the law. 
Uh, that is one way to protect yourself if you are in Minnesota. Um, Wisconsin simply says if you're not a participant, you're a spectator. So, you know, if you're a person who attends or watches a show but you don't actually participate in it, you're going to be deemed um, a spectator. Now, who is protected from liability? Who has the immunity under the statute? This is really important um, when you compare Minnesota with Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, it's very, very broad. So the liability protection is afforded to equine activity sponsors and equine professionals. Equine activity sponsors are people you know, who work for profit or not for profit, who organize or provide facilities for equine activities. So you know, that's barn owners, club operators, um, stables, therapeutic riding programs, it's very broad. An equine professional is someone who's engaged for compensation in the rental of horses um, or the rental of cats. Um, or someone who is a trainer or an instructor. Okay, so very broad, right, in Wisconsin. But then you get to Minnesota, and the people protected in Minnesota are not for profit. And um, in addition to simply not for profits, it's people who, or companies who donate services horses, facilities, or equipment for the use of a not-for-profit. So it's very limited. It's limited to not-for-profits. I think it's really important to know um, that the Minnesota statute does not say uh, that people who donate services or facilities um, for the benefit of a nonprofit, it says for the use of a nonprofit. So a lot of times in Polo, we have benefits for nonprofits where we donate the use of the facility to the nonprofit, but the nonprofit's not actually using it, right? It's just the polo club is using it to have a game or have a match to raise funds for the nonprofit. Um, I think that is not technically going to fall within the protection of the Equine Liability Act because the nonprofit's not actually using the facility. Um, it's just being used for the benefit of the nonprofit. So what do you do if you're a for-profit, you know, company or individual in Minnesota? Um, you're, you should use a release. And Yvonne will talk later about how to go about that in the best way possible. But properly, properly drafted and executed releases can build in the same protections provided to nonprofits under the Minnesota Liability Act uh, to your for-profit operation. So again, it's really important to make sure you have the proper written documentation to protect yourself. Okay, now we're gonna talk about exceptions to the protections afforded under the Liability Act. And so these are situations where, that are actually written into the statute where the liability immunity does not apply. The first one is um, faulty tack. That's in both Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, if you provide faulty tack or broken tack uh, that caused the injury or death to a participant in an equine activity and you knew or should have known that it was faulty, you're not going to be protected under the Act. Um, classic examples, you know, girth breaks or stirrup leather breaks and it's the cause of the rider falling and getting injured. You know, uh, one of the ways to preempt that exception applying would be to do a quick check of your tack every time you tack up. If you um, are a trainer and you have students tacking up their own horses, but it's your tack, make sure you check that tack before the rider gets on. Um, another good tip would be if you, um, for example, have a regular lesson program, institute a regular tack cleaning party on a weekly basis. And while you're cleaning, do your inspection then, because then you can go to the court if you're sued for faulty tack, and you can say, well, judge, we clean our tack every Sunday, and we regularly inspect it, and we never saw anything faulty with the tack. But at least you have that argument if you have those types of procedures in place. It gets a little trickier when it's the alleged 
quote unquote faulty tack is really a misadjustment. Um, you know, for example, if stirrups are too long on a rider and the rider loses the stirrup over a jump and falls off, um, or this happens all the time with one of my horses named Tango, um, the horse blows out when you put on the girth, right? And so they know what's coming, they blow out, they don't want to tight girth, so you have to tighten it before getting on. You forget saddle slips when you're riding, and you get dumped. Um, so you have to convince the judge at that point that it wasn't the tack that was actually faulty and or that it, the tack wasn't the cause of the injury. Another exception is what we call the mismatch exception. Um, and that's mismatching the rider to the horse, which is kind of what the sign um, images on that slide. So if you provide a horse to someone, but you don't make any reasonable efforts to determine the person's ability to ride the horse or manage that horse, uh, the liability protections aren't going to apply to you. So, you know, don't give a stallion to a 10-year-old girl who weighs 70 pounds dripping wet for a trail ride. Um, the dangerous latent condition ex exception. Um, that is if you have a dangerous hidden condition on your property. Um, so say, for example, if you're putting in a new fence, you dig all the holes for the fence, but then you know, you go up north for the weekend to go fishing and you, the posts don't get put in. Someone comes up, rides on your property. Um, there aren't cones or anything to alert someone that the holes are there. Uh, that is going to be a dangerous latent condition. In Wisconsin, um, the exception is if you fail to conspicuous, conspicuously post a warning sign of that dangerous condition that's hidden, and you know of the condition. Um, and that applies to either man-made or natural dangerous hidden conditions um, under the Wisconsin statute. Minnesota is slightly different. Um, it accepts uh, liability if it is a man-made, or accepts immunity if it is a man-made dangerous hidden condition and you fail to use reasonable care to protect the participants. Uh, the failed notice exception. So under Minnesota law or under the statute, um, if you're a sponsor, which means you sponsor or provide facilities for an equine activity that's open to the general public, and you fail to comply with the notice requirement of the visible warning sign that Yvonne had just talked about, you're not going to be afforded the protections under the Liability Act. Um, you know, this is one of the easiest things that we can all do to protect ourselves. So do not let this sign be the reason why you aren't afforded the liability protection under the Act. Uh, and then both Minnesota and Wisconsin have a sort of catch-all exception. And of course, again, because it's Minnesota and Wisconsin, there's a significant difference in this catch-all. In Wisconsin, um, you're not going to be protected if you intentionally cause the death or injury um, to someone or if you are deliberate in disregarding their safety. So if you are trying to get someone hurt on a horse, you're not going to be protected. I think that's common sense. Um, the same thing is in Minnesota. Uh, but what Minnesota does is they accept uh, if you are willful or negligent. So the negligence exception is very odd um, and it might be unique to Minnesota, but it seems to basically completely swallow the entire purpose of the act. Um, but that's exactly how it's written into the statute. Uh, we would argue to the court that the legislature could not have intended uh, to include ordinary negligence in the exception to the Liability Act because there would be no purpose to the protections afforded by the act if it did. Uh, so, what do you do with this sort of weird negligence exception or any of these exceptions really to the protections um, afforded under the Act? You get yourself a written executed release. And again, Yvonne will talk about how we can cover all of these exceptions um, in a written release. So the, the warning sign posting. In Minnesota, the requirement is that an activity sponsor, again, someone who sponsors or organizes or provides facilities to an activity that's open to the general public, must post 
plainly visible signs at one or more prominent locations on the premises where the activity takes place. And the sign has to include uh, a warning of the inherent risks of the livestock activity and the limitation of the liability under the statute. I'm sure we've all seen these signs at some point in our lives. Um, and they're really important to put up. Wisconsin is much more specific as to what it requires, um, but it's also similar. So again, a sign has to be posted in a clearly visible location on or near your stable or arena. It has to be white with black lettering, and each of the letters under Wisconsin law has to be a minimum of one inch in height. And there is very specific wording in the statute that must be included in a Wisconsin warning sign. Um, basically, when it comes to warning signs, don't get cute with the language, don't get cute with the signage, don't use, um, you know, your pretty barn colors, restate exactly what is required by the statute, and uh, restate how it is required to appear, whether that's black and white, the one inch requirement, it's going to vary by state, but make sure you are following the statutory requirement to achieve. Um, okay, so a couple of notes on what it means to be in a prominent location. You can't hide these signs behind the bushes or behind a tree and just hope that people um, see them somehow. What we would recommend is you identify a, the common location that everyone has to pass through to get to the area where the activity is happening. So for us on the polo fields, it's going to be the driveway, the entrance to the field. Um, if you're hosting an event, it could be the check-in table or the arena door. But make sure it is where a place where everyone has to go through to get to where the event is actually happening. That way, you know you're covered um, that it's a prominent location. And if you have people coming from different directions, uh, coming onto your property from different locations, from the back side of your property, from the front side of your property, put up the sign at both places. It's easy and it costs very little, just make sure you do it. Um, Wisconsin also has a requirement on the warning that if you're using a written contract to rent horses or tack um, or for riding instruction, the contract needs to contain the notice provision that's in the statute. And it needs to be clearly readable, bold print uh, that's the same type size as the rest of the contract. And now Yvonne is going to talk about how we can cover all of our bases where the Liability Act doesn't apply um, or accepts protection. Great, thanks, Suzanne. <clears throat> so as you know from both of our um, presentation pieces, there are liability protections afforded by the statute and there are exceptions to those liability protections. So our one of our strongest takeaways, if you haven't picked up on it by now, is our preaching of using what, our, what I'm going to call enforceable and effective liability releases. That doesn't just mean getting a liability release out of a form book. That doesn't mean using the one that your neighbor is using. This means using one that we draft for you that's specific for your equine activities, where you are doing it so we can comply with the applicable state statute. This means that having additional liability protections in place that a non-equine attorney or a form book would miss. So let me go, let me spend the next just few minutes talking about what is included in an enforceable and effective liability release. As we just discussed a few minutes ago, the statute will define who's a participant. Well, guess what you can do? Your liability release can define who's a participant. So where you have vulnerability to volunteers, to spectators, to sponsors, they are technically not engaged in an equine activity. That doesn't mean that your liability release can't define them as a participant. So your first line of your liability release is going to say the undersigned as a participant, and in parentheses, volunteer, client, spectator, sponsor, clinician, auditor, 
We can define who they are, and they are all participants under your liability release. Suzanne identified a number of activities that are defined as livestock or equine activities under the statute. What if what you're doing with horses is not included? Well, let's increase the definition of what is an equine activity in your liability release. She defined what are the inherent risks of equine activities. I guarantee you we could all come up with examples of inherent risks that are not provided by the statute, but let's put them in your liability release. The assumption of risk is a, a common phrase in the law, but let's put it right in your liability release that the person signing below expressly assumes the inherent risks of engaging in an equine activity. Well, when Suzanne and I have to defend your case in front of the judge, the judge is not going to know what are the inherent risks of equine activities. Suzanne was kind enough to point out that the Minnesota statute actually gives examples of some of those inherent risks, which include kicking, biting, bucking, or charging. Illinois, Wisconsin, most of the other state statutes do not give examples. So your liability release is going to tell the court, you know that the plaintiff is arguing that the horse rearing up and falling on the plaintiff was not an inherent risk of the equine activity. Well, guess what? Your liability release specifically includes rearing as an inherent risk of the equine activity. You've now taken away that argument from the plaintiff's attorney to say, my client didn't know that rearing, that a horse rearing was an inherent risk of the equine activity. The judge can look right at your release and say, it actually is right here as an example of an inherent risk that your client signed. The liability release will also identify who is a released party. Now, this is most important for those of you in Minnesota, as Suzanne just explained that the equine liability statute in Minnesota does not apply to uh, for-profit entities. It only applies to not-for-profit entities. So what can your liability release do to protect you as an individual or as a for-profit entity? You will be listed as a released party under the liability release that your participant is signing. So the release parties will include you by name, your facility by name, and by categories, your heirs, your beneficiaries, your spouse, your employees, your volunteers, your clinicians, your spectators, sorry, your sponsors, anyone that you want to include as a released party, whether or not it's provided by the statute, can be in your release and broaden the liability protections, the scope of the liability protections under your liability release. Now, Suzanne had made reference to being able to deal with the exceptions in a liability release. And I will tell you that I do include the inherent risks of injury as a result of faulty tanker equipment, as a result of the, uh, we can use different language, but essentially the mismatch of the horse and rider, as a result of a dangerous latent condition of the property. Those can be inherent risks of engaging in equine activities under your liability release. I would caution you not to include waivers of willful and wanton disregard or intentional wrongdoing, not because it has anything to do with the statute, but because contract law under each state may very well prohibit a liability release from waiving away intentional wrongdoing or willful and wanton. And again, it's important to consult with a lawyer who's familiar with the laws in your state because, for an example, in Illinois, you can waive away gross negligence, but that's not common in most other states. So as much as the liability release can broaden your liability protections, if you don't comply with the applicable, applicable state contract laws, the court can strike your liability release and say, you know what, this is too broad. I'm not going to enforce it at all. Um, in the, just a few minutes we have left, um, the liability release will specifically have release, hold harmless, defend, and indemnification language in it. It will define what is the waived losses, such as financial or other types of losses. The other thing your contract can do is it can change the time period within which somebody has to sue if their claim survives the, the waivers and the releases in your liability release. So if the statute of limitations, for example, in Florida is four years for personal injury, who wants to wait four years before they know if someone injured on their property or by their horse is going to sue? I don't think you want to wait four minutes, but the reality of it is your liability release can reduce that four years to one year.
and the court will enforce that. The liability limits for property damage can be reduced. I've had cases where somebody will claim that they had a $5,000 saddle that was stolen or lost from the facility. And the boarding contract that they signed limited property damage or loss claims to $500. Well, what you have just done is minimize what could have been a $5,000 case to a $500 case, and they're not going to find a lawyer to represent them on that one. Your liability release, very importantly, will select the, law, the applicable law and the jurisdiction and venue where any claim that survives can be filed. As Suzanne just articulated, there are such differences between Minnesota and Wisconsin. You may want your release to apply Wisconsin law. If you cross borders, you can do that. So if somebody comes in to ride with you from New York and they get hurt at your farm in Wisconsin, then they go home. If they're going to file suit, it has to be in Wisconsin, which means they have to find a lawyer in Wisconsin. They have to come to Wisconsin, and they're going to have to apply Wisconsin law, regardless of where they are or where you are. And so the important point here is when we draft a liability release for you that chooses the law, jurisdiction, and venue, you can use it anywhere you are engaging in equine activities or providing those equine activities. And the last point on this, because I know we're running short on time with you, is the liability releases in Minnesota very explicitly can be signed by a parent on behalf of a minor. Minors cannot sue contracts. I don't care what state you're in to be enforceable. But explicitly in Minnesota, parents can sign for a minor. And in most states, um, arguably, they can as well. The most important point here, though, is that when we draft liability releases for you, the signature line is going to have the parent signing on their own behalf as well as on behalf of their minor participant. Because like Suzanne said, if mom is the one standing at the gate and she gets run over and the liability release she signed was just for her child, she has not signed a liability release. You have no waiver from mom. So get one release that's signed by the parent on their own behalf and on behalf of their minor child. These are one-page documents, so nobody claims they didn't see the backside or theirs didn't have a page two. And as Suzanne just articulated, the warning language that is required by many states, but not all, but if it's required, will go right, along, right above that signature line. So that waiver notice, that, that warning, um, sorry, that warning notice cannot be said to be absent or wasn't seen in the contract. It's right above the signature line. In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and pass this to Suzanne to just touch on using insurance as one additional level of liability protection. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead. We're going to, we have another slide on creating LLCs to provide additional liability protection. But in the interest of time, if anybody has any questions about setting up an LLC or creating a corporation to provide another level of protection, we'll talk about that offline. Go ahead, Suzanne. I'm going to pass it over to you now. Thanks, Yvonne. Okay, so, you know, we've talked about a number of ways you can limit your liability um, through contracts and under the Act, but the you know, the problem is you can't actually stop someone from filing a lawsuit against you. You can have a lot of defenses based on the act, a lot of defenses based on the written release, but you can't actually prevent someone from filing a suit against you. So you need insurance. Um, and there's a whole bunch of insurance out there for the equine world that is really, really helpful um, in protecting you and your business. You know, they have boarding insurance, they have insurance for breeding, they have liability insurance for lesson programs, liability insurance for trainers. Um, you can buy event insurance if you host an event. Um, and you can buy liability insurance even as a personal horse owner, which I would recommend doing. Um, and the right liability insurance will provide you with defense and indemnity coverage in the event you are sued. So what does that mean? Defense coverage means that the insurance company is actually going to pay for you to have a lawyer. They're going to pay the lawyer for you to defend you against that lawsuit for a covered claim. Um, that is so important because you do not want to be paying legal fees out of your own pocket when you know that insurance exists. Uh, indemnity coverage is if you are in fact found liable or there's a settlement and damages um, need to be paid, the insurance company, if it's covered, would provide that payment for you so you don't have to go, you know, selling off assets to pay a judgment or a settlement. You need to um, 
of course, make sure you have adequate coverage limits. So if you're a four-stall operation and it's just in the backyard of your house and you don't have any you know, third parties coming onto your property to board horses, you probably don't need a million dollars in coverage. On the other hand, if you're a 30-stall barn um, and you run a training facility, a boarding facility, $300,000 that's probably okay for that small barn is not going to cut it for your huge operation. So it really depends on the size of your operation. It depends on what you do. Um, and you should really consult with an insurance professional um, who is familiar with placing equine risk insurance. Uh, you also need to understand your coverage and exclusions. I think a lot of people, people uh, a lot of times people assume that a homeowner's policy will provide the liability coverage you need for horses. Um, and while homeowner's policies might provide liability coverage for domestic pets, they don't mean horses. They mean the pets who live inside your house, you know, your dogs, cats, fishes, birds, whatever, but it's not horses. So if you have horses, at your house, you need to tell your homeowner's insurer, you need to tell your agent, um, and tell them how many horses you have. Um, if you tell them about one horse, but you actually have two horses, and one of the horses gets loose and injures someone, guess which horse the insurance company is going to say is the insured horse? The horse who stayed on the property, and not the horse who got loose. Um, homeowner's policies also typically exclude business pursuits or injury caused or arising out of a business pursuit, which means something done for profit. So say you have a barn at your house and your friend begs you to um, let her horse stay there and she'll pay you 200 bucks a month for it. And you say, okay, well, your homeowner's policy isn't going to provide coverage for an injury that arises out of that business pursuit. So if that horse gets loose and hurts someone, it's not going to be covered, even if it's not your regular job or your part-time job, and it's just a one-off, um, the insurance company is going to exclude coverage or going to deny coverage to you. So you have to really understand the coverage that's being provided, what exclusions there are, and how to fill the gap. Um, of course, if your operations change, you know, you using this example, you let your friend um, keep her horse, at your farm, you need to tell your insurance company when that happens. Of course, too, if you create a company, uh, make sure both you and your company are listed as insureds on your own policy. Um, and if you work with others in the equine industry, for example, if you own a barn but you have a trainer come onto the facility to give lessons to people, you should make sure that trainer, A, has their own insurance. Um, and you should request that you get added as a barn owner uh, as an additional insured under their policy. On the flip side, the trainer should be asking to be added as an additional insured on the owner's policy as well. Um, but that said, never rely on someone else to have insurance or have adequate insurance. Uh, so make sure you always have your own because you don't know if the other person hasn't paid a premium. Uh, you don't know if their limits are going to be enough to cover a claim even. So make sure you are adequately insured yourself. All right, Yvonne. Thanks, Suzanne. So I just want to wrap this up because I know we're, we're actually um, past our time at this point. I apologize. Um, we're not going to talk about the liabil limited liability companies, but again, we, we're welcome questions offline. And wanted to thank you so much for your attendance today. Um, Suzanne and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to add value to our industry um, services by providing these presentations. But one additional value adding um, component is going to be our availability to you for free initial consultations. Give us a call, send us an email. Um, the best way we can be of assistance is if you email us your liability release and you say, I attended your webinar, can you take a look at my liability release and let me know if I have all those things that Yvonne just spewed out at us and, you know, make sure that I have the opportunity to, to tell you what's missing and what can be done better. And then as an additional bonus, we want to offer you a one-time flat fee to revise or more likely redraft your liability release for you at a one-time flat fee of $250 as well as if any future services are needed, we will continue that reduced hourly rate of $250 from our normal $350 an hour rate. Just as an added thank you for attending this University of Minnesota 
uh, webinar, and we thank the university for making this available. And with that being said, um, Suzanne and I uh, will, as I said, make ourselves available to you for any follow-up questions even past this webinar. Thank you so much for your attendance and your time. Thank you so much, Yvonne and uh, Suzanne. Um, we are approaching the 1 o'clock hour, so for those of you who do need to move on to the rest of your day, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who can stay on, we um, still have the chat box open, and we'll stay on for a few more minutes um, to hopefully answer some of those questions. I've not seen any questions come through, but I do have some questions that I would like to um, throw out to Yvonne and Suzanne. First of all, where's the best place to likely purchase one of the liability signs? Should they just go to Google? <laughs> or are there places that are better than others that you know the wording is correct and the size requirements are um, correct? Uh, my advice, and Suzanne certainly can add on to this, is I would start with your local horse council. Um, I know the Illinois Horse Council, you can buy them right online, and I think they're 25 bucks. You can also go to your local tax shops, I've seen them in the tax shops as well. If you're concerned about the compliance with the statute, I believe many of the signs at the bottom right or left hand corner will actually cite the statute. So you can check to see if the statute is cited, you can feel very confident that it complies. But certainly if you buy it from any other um, any other venue that doesn't have the statute posted, compare the language and make sure that it complies with the statute. But I would definitely um, rely on the ones provided by your local horse council as being in compliance with their local state statutes. Oh, I don't know if I can't hear you right now. Oh, huh. okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, next. I have a question regarding like um, the failure of tack or equipment. And if you say, and if you are in a lawsuit and you say, well, we do weekly inspections, is there something you should do that would provide proof of that? Or would they just take your word for it? You want to address this one, Suzanne? Or I'm, I'm yeah, gonna... sure. Well, if you have a written policy, that of course is more helpful. Um, but if you have that procedure in place and you have, you know, 20 of your orders there at the same time, I, I think that a court would accept that as an established practice at your barn if everyone's saying, yep, that's what we do every Sunday. We all get together and we all clean our tax. So then building off of that, is it a good practice in your equine business to have a set of procedures that would likely help your case in in something like that down the road? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Yvonne, jump in too if you want. But um, anytime you can prepare up front and put into practice um, certain procedures that will help cover your you know what in the event of a lawsuit we always recommend doing it um, because you know from our our position the best line of defense is being prepared uh, before anything happens and so you know having a formal procedure outline or whatever and something that's actually implemented is most definitely helpful if you're ever in the position where you need to defend yourself so then if you do have one of these books of procedures in place, say you, you own and operate a boarding facility, do your boarders need to show proof that they have reviewed that? Or would that be like uh, they could request access for it and it would be included on their um, release that they would sign initially? We would recommend um, definitely providing a copy of the procedures or operating procedures of the barn to every boarder um, and having them sign off on it and keeping a copy of that signed uh, uh, document in your file. Very good. For those of you still online, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat box. 
Um, I do have one more question that I, I have lots of notes, <laughs> but I have one more question that I did jot down. And actually, it was for you, Suzanne, when you were talking about um, those who are treating or doing any medical care to an animal, and you insinuated there's differences between Minnesota and Wisconsin. So can you elaborate on that and maybe clarify? Does that mean our veterinarians, if they are hurt by our horse while treating it, are we liable for that? Or can you just um, elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. So in Wisconsin, um, an equine activity is actually expressly defined to include assisting in the medical treatment of an equine. That is found nowhere in the definition of equine activity in Minnesota. So how I interpret that is, say for example, you've got a barn manager who administers butte to borders horses when they request it. Um, that barn manager is assisting in the medical treatment of an equine. Um, even though they're not, you know, getting on the horse or uh, riding the horse or training the horse or whatever, um, and that activity would fall within the purview of the Wisconsin statute, but not necessarily the Minnesota statute. So yes, it's an exposure under Minnesota law, which you can deal with, of course, in your written release. I think you're on mute, though. <laughs> the cat. So, should we have our veterinarians be signing a release and any of their technicians who might come on site? Yvonne, what do you think? I get asked that actually both ways. I get asked by veterinarians if they should have liability releases signed by their clients who are insisting on holding the horse or being in the in the vicinity. Um, but the the reality of it is is Anybody who comes onto your property should be signing your liability release if they're coming on in any capacity because anyone can get hurt on your property. The caveat to that, well, two caveats. One is Suzanne and I are horse people too. We get it. You can only police it so much. You can only be there so much. Um, but at the end of the day, the professionals are going to be held to a higher standard of assumption of risk than just your certainly more than a spectator or an auditor. Um, or even a client who's, who's assisting with the treatment of their horse. But if somebody's just a bystander, the court's not going to hold them to as high a standard of assumption of risk. So what I always say about the professionals is, yeah, if you feel comfortable having them sign a release and blame it on your lawyer, blame it on your insurance company and say, you know, anyone who comes to my property has to sign, but feel somewhat confident that the court's going to say to the veterinarian, you are in the business of putting yourself underneath a horse or giving a horse a shot, which we can only assume they're not going to like, or sticking your arm in their mouth to, to float their teeth, that you, that you assume that higher degree of risk. The caveat to that is um, I did have a case where a farrier was working on a horse out in the field where the client had put the horse, basically tied it to a fence to have the farrier work on it. The horse reared up, kicked out at the farrier, and the farrier fell back and banged his head on the stone and died. And the court was questioning whether or not that was that an assumption of the risk of the farrier. And one of the decisions of the court was that, yes, he assumes the risk of being under a horse, but the problem is that the client put the horse in an area where they should have observed the surroundings and seen that there were these big boulders in the, in the area and not put the horse in that location. So it's not a catch-all that says, well, the... Um, the professionals assume all this risk, so I don't have to take any care. But I think you can take some comfort in knowing that if the horse is in cross ties where the veterinarian wanted him, that that veterinarian is going to assume the risks inherent in providing his veterinary services. All right, very good. Are there any other questions um, from any of the viewers? Uh, go ahead and type them into the chat box. We'll give you a few seconds here. Um, maybe half a minute. Um, I've included the web address in the chat box where you will be able to review um, this webinar and share it with those um, that haven't been able to join us today. And I also want to include that Yvonne and Suzanne have actually contributed to our newsletter for the last three months and um, touching on a lot of these same concepts. 
And um, I have included a link to our archived newsletters as well. So you can go back and read those. Um, if you do not receive the monthly newsletter, there is a place on the um, Horse Extension website to, to actually sign up for those. We're going to do last call for any questions <laughs> in the chat box. So Deb is one of our, Deb Treadwell is one of our insurance agents in Minnesota that many people um, use and are familiar with, and she said she would like to see future discussion on the need for work comp on horse farms. So Deb, would that be for employees, I assume then? And Deb, we can actually develop that. Um, <laughs> we can develop that and even um, direct that to Yvonne and Suzanne directly. I can just comment here real quick that workers' comp is um, a very hotly contested issue in my in my practice. I'm sure Suzanne's seen it too, where clients will ask us, "Well, I have grooms or um, stall cleaners that come and work at my farm, but they're not my employees. And what if they get hurt?" Or what if I have working students? They're not getting paid, but they're working at my farm. And actually, Suzanne is, is much more well-versed in insurance coverage matters than I am. But I can say that there is no clear answer except to say that as an employment lawyer, I can tell you that the definition of employee is going to be met in the equine industry because these people are providing an integral service for the type of equine activity that you're providing. So if you're a boarding operation, cleaning stalls would have to be done by an employee if it was not done by this person you're calling an independent contractor or this person that you're having to um, have as a working student in exchange for riding lessons. If they weren't doing it, you'd have to hire an employee, not to mention the state wants their payroll taxes, right? They want their, their FUDA and FICA and all their other deductions. If they're treated as independent contractors and paid a 1099 or, which Suzanne and I will say never happens, being paid, paid cash, and uh, not being accounted for at all, the law is going to say, no, we're not getting our fair share. These are your employees under the 14-point test. And if your state requires workers' comp, then you could get nailed, if you will, for not having the required workers' compensation insurance that's required by your state if you have, an, if you have employees. Florida is one of those states where you have agricultural exemptions. And you, if you fall under the required criteria, you can be exempt from workers' comp. The problem is workers' comp provides um, exclusive remedies. And so if somebody's injured, they can only bring a workers' comp claim. Well, if you've been exempted from workers' comp, now they can file a claim of tort against you, which means they can get emotional distress and pain and suffering and all these damages that wouldn't otherwise be recoverable if it was a workers' comp made claim. Does that make sense? That was enlightening for me. I wasn't sure about that. Um, and, but Deb's comment was that too many farms attempt to call their employees independent. And so then I'm assuming that's their way of not getting or not securing workers' comp. Yeah, workers' comp, is, and I've been told by a lot of my horse breeding operations, is the most uh, costly expense that they have at their facility. And I had the same reaction you kind of did just, Abby, and say, well, wait a minute, feeding horses and training horses and painting your fences and your landscaping, those are expenses. And yet you're telling me that your workers' comp insurance is your greatest expense and they will say undeniably yes. And that's what discourages a lot of our farms from, one, categorizing them as W-2 employees, but also carrying workers' comp because it's cost prohibitive. And that's all great unless and until you have an injury and you have a lawsuit for workers' comp. So it's like speeding, you know, it's not against the law unless you get caught and it's not a problem unless you get in an accident. So if you don't carry workers' comp and you categorize everyone as 1099 employees, that's great and that works until it doesn't. So um, Suzanne and I cannot tell you you're right or wrong because the 14-point test has to be analyzed if they're an employee or an independent contractor. 
But the problem is, is the, the law is what governs when the judge decides whether or not they were an employee or not. And if you did not have the required workers' comp insurance, that's where you could have that personal liability and potentially even lose your farm because you did not have, as Suzanne identified, the, the proper and the proper amount of insurance for this type of a claim. So it's essentially that it's a risk that they have to gamble on. Okay. Yep, that's right. Deb comments, it's very frustrating <laughs> with, with the situation in Minnesota. I appreciate her comments, and, and that is a topic that Suzanne and I could address in a whole other presentation, and I would welcome that opportunity because it's, it's a great topic to discuss. It's one of those things that nobody wants to talk about because they just want to keep doing it the way they're doing it, and they don't want to be told otherwise. But when they come to us with a claim and we say, do you have workers' comp insurance? And they say, no, I don't because he's the only worker I have and I didn't want to do payroll and W-2 and he didn't want to pay taxes. Um, maybe he's not legal, whatever. It doesn't even matter. But they don't have insurance. Well, now that claim that's brought in tort for negligence um, can include pain and suffering and all these other recoverable damages that they would not have exposure to. And we end up usually settling them, one, because the plaintiff's attorney realizes there's no insurance. So they're not going to have a big big win. But if your client is a big productive facility, they could be looking at a, a pretty big um, either settlement number or a judgment that they're going to have to find a way to pay. Wow. Well, I think we could probably carry on this conversation with Deb for another a half hour or an hour. Um, but I don't see any other further conversation coming from the other attendees. So again, I'd like to thank Suzanne and Yvonne for your time um, today. And certainly head to the uh, webinar library online. And you can review this entire webinar, share it amongst your friends or business partners, or those who own your boarding stables that you board at. Um, and join us again on May 30th for our um, second quarter webinar on fly protection. So thanks for joining us. Have a good spring, everyone. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you.